Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. The Market Journal mobile app was released in early 2012 for iPads and smartphones, such as iPhones and Android devices. To celebrate the success of the app, Market Journal is hosting its first photo contest for our viewers. To participate, contestants need to download the free Market Journal app on their smartphones through the Google Play or iTunes stores. Once the app is downloaded, participants need to locate the camera feature in the app and take their best photo. This year's theme is soybeans, so photos must somehow relate to soybeans. Once the photo has been captured, it will need to be submitted through the Market Journal app. To be considered for the grand prize, contestants must describe their photo and provide contact information. Each contestant has until September 9th to submit up to five different photos, which will be voted on by our Facebook fans. The winner of the photo contest will receive a new iPad in September. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, Elaine Cubb is our marketing analyst. Bruce Anderson outlines forage options, we'll look at the prominence of soybean aphids with Bob Wright, and Gary Zobeck will talk about scheduling the final irrigation application of the season. In its latest World Agriculture Supply and Demand Estimates, the USDA projected 2012-2013 soybean yield at 36.1 bushels per acre. Its corn yield of 123.4 bushels per acre would be the lowest yield since the 1995 growing season. We started our marketing segment this week by asking Elaine Cub if those numbers were best case scenario and anything lower is already factored in. The saying or the cliche is a short crop gets shorter and that could certainly be the case this year if we look at 2010 and 2011 as comparison years of recent years when you see kind of a disappointing crop. We certainly did continue to see a trend all the way through harvest, a higher trend because the yields were disappointing and, and USDA kept shaving off their their estimates. But in this case, you know, it's a guess. And there's a lot of the, the farther fringes of the Corn Belt that usually aren't as large of a contributor to the overall production are the areas that might do better. We're talking about Minnesota, the Dakotas. They really have not struggled in the same way that Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and Nebraska has this year. So it's, I think there's going to be more of a guess and it'll be a, you know, a, a continuing discussion over the next couple of months. Can those states factor into price at all? I mean, are they going to have any effect? I think so. I mean, if you look at uh, southern Minnesota produces one of the is one of the top 10 regions of producing corn. So really, since in the past 10 years, when we've seen better corn mm -hmm. varieties come on the market and the expansion of acres to all of these areas, they really are becoming a bigger player. So yes, I think there's a possibility if we're going to see a harvest slump in prices, it will probably occur around that time frame that they're being harvested. Let's talk about soybeans. All right? South America crop doesn't go until January, so that means that it, the phrase is the window is open for U.S. soybeans. Does that mean that the window is only open till January and you need to sell before then? I mean, yes. I think if you look at a, a time frame, a seasonal time frame mm. of when you might hit the best prices, that would be the way to go. There's going to be a wild basis at, at this time frame because I think everybody's going to want to unload their beans at harvest or very near harvest. I think there's going to be very little bean storage going through the 2013 calendar year just because the opportunities aren't going to be there. And 2013, does that also mean you need to contract out before then a decent portion? Well, 2013 production, you know, like I said, you're not going to be bothering marketing old crop beans, I don't mm -hmm. think, through that year. So you're going to be looking ahead to your production in that year. And yes, I think, 
you know, there's a real possibility that if we ever get reasonably normal weather, we could have very large production, and you might be looking at these prices now as a good opportunity. Let me tee, uh, have you tee off on ethanol here. We're seeing increased production at a time that prices are still remaining high. How long can that continue? Well, as long as the crude oil markets, you know, keep mm -hmm. reimbursing them and the DDG markets. Right now, uh, they can turn around. Some ethanol plants are selling DDGs for nearly 100% of the price of corn. So if they're byproducts and the ethanol itself continues to have a higher trend, they may be able to stay solvent and keep going. And I think there is some hope that the overall commodity markets might really get juiced up here. China keeps making noises about adding in some stimulus. So that would certainly affect the crude oil market and energy in general, and that, that would help ethanol in general. How, how concerned are you that a waiver could factor into what you do for 2013? I think any reaction to a change in the government policy on ethanol would be probably a severe reaction in the short term, but long term, the plants and the industry still needs ethanol to blend with right, gasoline. Right. I mean, the economics are still there that make sense to keep doing it. So overall, I think the demand will still be there. As volatile as these grain markets have been over the past four weeks, let's say, what are you seeing for speculators? Are they still coming in and playing? No, we're not really seeing a lot of new activity from them. Uh, there was certainly a lot of interest, certainly for soybeans. We did see large amounts of speculative participation, but they largely have stayed out of corn. Uh, certainly a drought story. We see a lot of media coverage, mm -hmm. and you expect to see a lot of speculation come in when there's a lot of media coverage like that, but it hasn't occurred just because these are frightening times for people. They're more interested in preserving their money, um, you know, in having safe havens for their cash rather than, you know, a lot of these riskier investment ideas. When you look at either corn or beans, are you of the thought that Corn could be something that goes to double digits, and beans could be something that goes to twenty dollars. I am not looking at that at well, this that's disappointing. point, unless the dollar mm -hmm. changes. You know, I think the dollar right now has stayed off of making new highs, but th that is still something that could come in and really make that happen. Um, the global economy having a stimulus being, you know, less of a concern about demand destruction. That that would, I think, is what it would take to see more extreme right. record highs. Demand destruction that hasn't already been factored in, you mean? Right, right. If that does not occur. And how much more is there to go, realistically I, here? You know, no. I think people understand, you know, the economics of whether or not they can use the grain at this price. Our livestock feeders are doing the math. Ethanol plants are doing the math. And I think the, the situation is fairly well known and fairly well priced in at this point. So I'm not necessarily looking at a significant change in trend. It might kind of, kind mm. of drift along here for a while. Talk of demand rationing continues for both crops. The push to release ethanol mandates gained two more voices this week as governors of North Carolina and Arkansas officially petitioned for a waiver. Governors from Maryland and Delaware made the same move last week. Meanwhile, for the third consecutive week, ethanol production in the U.S. increased. The rural Main Street Index has dropped for the third straight month. The survey of community bank presidents and CEOs across 10 states is now at its lowest level since April 2009. Ernie Goss, a Creighton University economist and a creator of the survey, said the drought is dampening economic activity across the region, which includes Nebraska. The farmland price index fell to its lowest mark since July 2009, and farm equipment sales dropped to the lowest reading since October 2008. Earlier this week, we talked with UNL Extension Forage Specialist Bruce Anderson about options producers have to use corn and soybean as forage. We first asked what producers should keep in mind if they decide to turn cows out into a less than productive cornfield. Well, I think there's two things we're probably watching most carefully with grazing the corn. One, of course, is to reduce the waste a little bit because the cows can certainly trample a lot of that corn. So one of the things we're advocating with folks is that they just allocate uh, three, four days at a time worth of corn to the animals using uh, a cross electric fence, uh, maybe driving down some corn to make it easy to put up the fence. And, and then after they've grazed for a few days, move uh, a new fence down so that they can get another small supply that way they don't have free reign of the whole field and, and run over most of the corn rather than graze it. The other thing is, is being a little cautious yet about nitrates. Mm -hmm. Typically we aren't going to worry too much about nitrates in corn fields, but in places where, for instance, maybe the corn only got three feet tall and the cows are going to graze it all the way to the ground, those could be some pretty hot areas that we may want to fence out if we're going to be grazing just in case uh, those are uh, real hot spots. Or we find other places 
places where manure and fertilizer both were used and the whole plant might have some higher nitrates. We've got to have some cautious that way also. Let's look at soybeans. There are producers that are looking at using soybeans as forage because they don't think they'll get enough yield to harvest them. Uh, how tight is that window getting before producers need to make that decision? And what's the yield difference that you can look at? Okay, well, I think the, the decision time frame really has to be when the beans start turning yellow at mm -hmm. the bottom and leaves are getting ready to drop. If we drop very many leaves, we're going to lose a lot of our yield and much of the quality forage that might be available out there. So that's kind of the time frame, and each field is going to be kind of different in terms of when that's going to occur. Uh, if we're trying to decide, uh, the hay out there is probably going to be yield somewhere in most fields one, one and a half tons worth of hay. Uh, its value is anybody's guess, yeah. uh, but that's what we balance with the number of bushels of beans we might get off of there and, and see which might be the best uh, return for us. So is there a level that you go to if the beans are going to yield, if I think they're going to yield X number of bushels per acre, then I leave them go? or if they're going to be below that level, do I harvest them for forage? Well, I would certainly say that at about the 10 bushel level, we're probably at a point where harvesting the beans with the price of those beans right now is, is a fairly a, attractive point. But if it's below 10, we, we may get more value out of harvesting it as a hay crop rather than as beans. Label restrictions when you're talking about using these to feed uh, if you've applied any kind of uh, herbicide, pesticide, anything like Very that. important to take a look at the labels. Insecticides, some of them absolutely prohibit the use of that uh, as a feedstuff. Many herbicides, other than things like glyphosate, uh, may not have any uh, uh, wording at all about it and may not have been approved for it also. So we have to take a look at our labels on what we used. Farmers are going to get the crops out of the field quite early this year. If they're going to plant forage back in, is it too dry or does that not matter? Well, I think the dryness is real important criteria there because the soil got kind of super dry here this summer. And so we've been recommending to folks that they actually wait to plant until we've had about two inches of rain within a one week's time period just to get the crop established. And then after that, we need more rain to, to grow a significant amount of feed out there. If it would happen to rain, that's a big if right now. If it would happen to rain and pastures maybe get a little help from that, they turn green, is it okay to turn cows out there or do you not do that? Well, it's sure tempting to put yeah. them out there on some of that green feed, but it, it may be one of the worst things we could do out in those pastures because they've been stressed so much already. Then they start to green up and, and pull out of their root reserves to try and do some more greening. And if we put added stress onto them with additional grazing there, uh, that's going to make them even weaker going into the winter. So I think we're at the point now where any pastures that are done really are done and we shouldn't be grazing them anymore no matter what kind of moisture we get for this year. Just save all of that growth and any of that uh, recovery for next year's use. I'm going to ask you to speculate a little bit here. We knew forage supplies were going to be tight this year with the drought in Texas last year. Now we have Texas drought followed by a drought across the Midwest. How tight are forages going to be next year? They're getting really tight. Uh, we're not going to have much carryover next year, that's for sure. Uh, I think there's a lot of fingers being crossed that we have enough enough supply just for this winter because so many of the stored forages are already starting to be used. It's not just a winter supply. It's going to be a late summer and fall use situation for many f people. While drought has taken a toll on Nebraska crops and rangeland this year, the ag industry remains the major driver of the state's economic activity. The August Nebraska Farmer details a new University of Nebraska-Lincoln report that shows the ag production complex accounts for one-fourth of the state's economy. The end result is that Nebraska has become a leader in the ever-expanding global food economy. You can read more about Nebraska's local, national, and global ag impact in the August Nebraska Farmer. High temperatures have kept soybean aphids at bay for most of this summer. We talked with UNL Extension entomologist Bob Wright earlier this week about why that might change. Well, they're out there, but this hot weather we've been having really suppresses their growth. They, they're like us. They like it when it's in the 70s and mid 80s. So the temperatures we're expected to have in the next couple of weeks is really going to favor their reproduction. And aphids have a very short or can reproduce rather quickly and build up. Uh, populations can build up and or double in three to four days with favorable conditions. So soybean aphids are in a lot of soybean fields are just at relatively low levels, but this milder weather is going to favor their buildup. So conceivably over the next few days where we're looking at temperatures in the mid 70s to 80s uh, across at least southeastern Nebraska, those are favorable conditions? Right, that's perfect weather for soybean aphids to reproduce. And so if people haven't been watching their fields, now, the now is the time they really should get out and check their fields. The other thing is we're late in the season when it comes to 
how this season has gone in terms of the advancement of the plant. So what, uh, how advanced does the plant need to be before you don't need to treat? Okay, maybe I should throw in the threshold too sure. while we're talking about it. Yep. When they're checking things, if we have 250 aphids per plant and the populations are increasing, which they, they probably are gonna be doing at this time of year with this weather, that's a treatable level. Uh, and that, that threshold is good through the R5 stage of soybeans, which is the pod fill stage. Once uh, you have pods where the beans are fully uh, meeting or touching the pod walls on the upper four nodes, that's the R6 stage. And at that point, it's not gonna pay to treat. Uh, so a lot of fields are still in the R5 stage. This is the time to last chance to check for soybean aphids. Is that because of how the aphid affects the plant or what it goes after? Right, uh, once you get to the R6 stage, the uh, threshold raises a lot for soybean aphids. They're less likely to cause economic damage. What are you recommending to treat with? There's a variety of products. Uh, uh, pyrethroids are used widely. There are some other uh, uh, organophosphates. We have information on the entomology website that uh, has all that information. The concern though at this time of year, some of the pyrethroid insecticides have relatively long pre-harvest intervals from 45 to 60 days. So before you spray, check the label and make sure that the uh, pre-harvest interval is not going to be interfere with your harvest plans. Uh, what about spider mites as we're looking at those? Because those have been really one of the more major concerns so far this year. Yeah, they're still out there again. This cooler weather is not going to stop them, but it'll slow them down. Uh, so as you're checking for soybean aphids, also be aware of spider mites. Uh, there isn't a lot of research on soybean spider mites, but we would expect that the same uh, guidelines in terms of timing for soybean aphids would apply for spider mites. So once you reach the R6 or full pod stage, probably isn't going to pay to treat for spider mites either. Perhaps I should ask the question about soybean yields and if the farmer needs to make a personal decision about if he thinks he's going to get a good enough yield to treat with anyway on either spider mites or, or soybean aphids. If, yeah, the, if it's rain fed and it's uh, low yield potential, that would be a, a consideration. Uh, you probably want to raise the threshold a little bit in that situation. If it's an irrigated field that has high yield potential, uh, we can still probably save some yield at this time of year if you have high populations of spider mites or soybean aphids. And this year there are some more tools that producers can use to scout their fields and decide whether or not to treat. Yeah, there's two things actually. Uh, we have a speed scouting procedure for soybean aphids, so you don't have to actually count the number of aphids per plant. What you do is decide or count whether there's 40 or more aphids per plant. And if there are, you call that infested. And it, it really speeds up the scouting procedure. And then also we have a smartphone app that basically takes that spreadsheet and puts it on a smartphone. So you can make a decision with, with, on your smartphone using the speed scouting procedure. Uh, and that automatically has the threshold worked into there. So that's, that's some new things we have for soybean aphids out scouting. We'll see what temperatures you can expect for this week when Al gives his forecast in a few minutes. The drought is pounding crop conditions across the state and forcing irrigations to work overtime. But UNL Extension Irrigation Specialist Bill Krantz says relying almost solely on artificial rains this year can show producers where they can improve their operations. Well, one of the things that certainly this time of the year and the year like we're having in 2012 would provide is an opportunity to go out and look at the uh, effectiveness of their irrigation practice with their distribution systems, whether they be with a center pivot or with a furrow irrigation system. But in particular, center pivots are designed to apply water uniformly, but in some cases due to uh, sprinkler wear and tear, due to replacement of uh, a damaged sprinkler with one that wasn't meant to be in that position and, and other kinds of things, water distribution is not as uniform as it normally would be. The summer we've had in 2012 is going to allow the producer to go out in the field and look, um, from a bird's eye view would be the best, uh, at what the crop is telling them is happening related to water. And we've got uh, aerial photographs showing um, differences in crop uh, physical features in terms of their the greenness and their potential production levels and all those kinds of things that, that show up if you look at things from the air. And so by 
looking on the field situation on a year like we've had in 2012 will allow you to clearly identify where those issues exist and are likely to have existed even when we had more normal precipitation but are masked by the fact that we normally get more rainfall and therefore the consequences of those uh, problems with the irrigation system are not as visible as they would be this year. For more information, you can read Bill's recent article on the CropWatch website. You may also be looking at irrigation systems and thinking about making the final application of the season. We talked with UNL Extension educator Gary Zobeck this week about what to look for when scheduling the final irrigation passes during a year that hasn't seen much help from Mother Nature. No, it's been an extremely long irrigation season for much of Nebraska. Uh, but we are nearing the end right now, I guess. Especially for corn, probably. Are there some irrigators that are even done? I think there's many irrigators that are, that are done. Basically, it's important to stage your crop uh, from beginning dent. We're going to use about five more inches. If the starch line is halfway up, we're going to use about two and a half inches. It's important to try and not overfill the profile. Uh, we want to dry it down to that 60% depleted so that Hopefully Mother Nature will refill it during the off season. Let's talk about soybeans. Uh, we're probably getting into the, into the stage where we're starting to, to get to the end of it. Yes, soybeans are probably using a little bit more at this time compared to corn. Depends upon your growth stage and when you plant it. Early planted uh, beans are probably not going to be using uh, as much moisture. Again, it's important to stage them. At R5, we're going to use about six and a half inches of water. Uh, as we get to R6, where we've got a bean the size of the cavity in the pod, we're going to use about three and a half inches. And then when the leaves are starting to yellow and drop, we're going to use about two more inches. So it uh, depends upon the stage of growth. Uh, you need to use that to make a decision on how much to irrigate. The key is, again, not having a full profile at the end of the season. But at capacity? Uh, you don't want to, what you want is you want to draw down the moisture so it's about 50 percent depleted, half of the available water there because then during the off season Mother Nature will hopefully refill it. You gave us some good good guides as to, to how to tell for which stage you're in. Uh, when you look at trying to figure out that last irrigation pass of, of beans especially, what's the yield difference? I mean, you know, are you talking about getting too greedy if you don't go one more pass? Well, if you've got available water in the soil, putting on that extra pass is not going to improve yields at all. And so that's, but if you stop too early, if say you've got a soil that's uh, really dry, uh, you can hurt your yields considerably by not putting on that last irrigation. So it's key to know what you have in the soil as well as your stage of growth. As we look forward to next year, I know a lot of farmers are worried about a consecutive drought year. How closely are you going to be watching what the, the recharge is over the winter? Well, we definitely would like to have plenty of recharge because it's, it's especially important in the rain-fed situation. Most years we get enough during the off season to refill it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be planting crops because, uh, and only time will tell. There is a NEB guide available to help you schedule the last irrigation of the season. We'll link to that on our website. And now to forecast any chances of precipitation over the next week, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again. Time for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the main forecast, let's take a look at this last week. We did see a cool front come through last weekend, of course, brought some cooler conditions. And then we've seen a gradual warm-up into the midweek period. The warmest temperatures, of course, were across western Nebraska, closer to the western U.S. ridge. Here in eastern Nebraska, we were able to share in some of that troughing action a few extra days. It brought the cool conditions in before we've seen some temperatures moving into the mid-90 degree range across the eastern part of the state. And then once again, we had another cold front come through that was very disappointing in the amount of precipitation it put out. Considering last week it was generating a half an inch to an inch and a half of precipitation, most locations didn't receive any way, anything significant. The only moisture that was of any consequence fell, fell across extreme northern Nebraska and then some pockets across extreme southern Nebraska. We've got a couple more chances of precipitation in the forecast, so let's take a look at this next seven days and see whether it's going to occur and what days it will occur. And the first thing I'll draw your attention to is here's that upper air trough responsible for the cool conditions and a piece of energy is expected as the day moves through to pass through eastern Nebraska and then slide into the southern portion of the central corn belt. So we do have the chance for isolated showers 
and thunderstorms across eastern Nebraska, maybe a 20-30% chance, but we'll take what we can get. Very dry conditions across western Nebraska, and as you'll notice as we go to tomorrow, we'll see that that trough starts to lift out into the eastern Corn Belt and weaken, and the ridge is trying to make its way in ever so slowly. We don't expect any moisture with uh, the precipitation pattern on Sunday. We do expect to see some precipitation as we get into Monday. As we see another piece of energy come out of the central uh, Rocky Mountains and head toward Oklahoma, this may generate some scattered showers and isolated thunderstorms across the western one-third of the state. Now, as we go into Tuesday, we're going to see that ridge trying to build back in, and there's another trough to our northwest, but overall we're expecting a dry pattern and we'll see some warmer temperatures, especially in western Nebraska where we may see temperatures making it up into the upper 90s. As we get into Wednesday, here comes that system. So we may see some showers generating itself during the afternoon hours across northern Nebraska, and then that activity will slide toward the southeast as during the overnight hours into Thursday morning. Again, we'll be looking at a slight cool down as that cold front comes through in the northwest where we could see mid-80s and we'll be still stuck in the upper 90s across the southwest. Now on Thursday, much cooler conditions move into the region. The precipitation moves to our east. Under that northwest flow, we'll be looking at highs. It'll be in the low 80s across the northeast, but we'll still be in the mid-90s across the southwest. As we get into Friday, the ridge starts to rebuild back in. Warmer conditions come in. We'll be looking at highs in the low to mid-80s northeast, again to the mid-90s across the southwest. 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. Continues the cool trend. In terms of precipitation, we see kind of a normal pattern, so maybe we'll get some moisture with this. Now, the bad news. Here's the forecast initially for September. Above normal temperatures across a good portion of the country, and unfortunately, they continue to indicate below normal precipitation with eastern Nebraska on the western periphery of this core of dryness. Thanks, Al. Market Journal viewers have three more weeks to submit their soybean-related photos for a chance to win an iPad. Photos must be submitted through the Market Journal mobile app for smartphones. Visit marketjournal.unl.edu slash contest for full details. You can also visit the website to see all of our coverage from our recent trip to China. Next week, we'll report from the Goodmanson Sandhills Lab open house, and we'll show you interviews from the 2012 Soybean Management Field Day in David City. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.